As many expected, the lawsuits have been coming fast and furious from the Trump campaign as the week's gone on. On top of plans to demand a recount in Wisconsin, which is well within their rights, they filed suits in four states so far, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Michigan, and Georgia, although a judge in Savannah quickly dismissed that last suit, which accused local election officials in the surrounding county of mixing in ballots that arrived on time with ones that missed the state's deadline of 7 p.m. on Election Day. This afternoon, a Michigan judge also denied the campaign's request to halt ballot counting until they could get more access to observe the process. A Pennsylvania judge ruled on a similar lawsuit this morning as well, allowing GOP observers to watch all aspects of ballot processing. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign has also sued Pennsylvania Secretary of State for extending the deadline for some first-time voters to provide ID that would let them vote by mail. They've also asked to join a lawsuit that's already before the Supreme Court looking to overturn that state's mail-in ballot extension. And in Nevada, the campaign is claiming as many as 10,000 votes came from people who are either deceased or no longer live there. The president summed up his strategy on Twitter this morning saying, all of the recent Biden claimed states will be legally challenged by us for voter fraud and state election fraud. Plenty of proof. But is there? We're joined now by Jeannie Sue Gerson. She's a professor at Harvard Law School and a contributing writer at the New Yorker magazine. Jeannie, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Now, there have been a multitude of lawsuits, as I just described. I think you called it a legal cacophony, some of which have already been dismissed. But are any of these lawsuits that have been filed so far, at least, are they potential outcome changers or not? So far, it doesn't look like they are. Um, I, th I would sum it up as um, a strategy of throwing a lot of things up in the air. And it, the purpose of it is not necessarily even that one of them is going to work. It's that the, the plentiful nature of all of these suits means that people then have some doubts mm -hmm. about about whether this whether there actually was fraud. You know what's incredible, I think, to a lot of voters? This year there were so many mail-in votes. People followed the rules, got their ballots, went through the whole procedure, carefully filled them out, got them in on time played by the rules, like I said, and now they're having politicians change the rules, not just in the middle of the game, but after the game. Is that, how is that okay? What, what are voters supposed to make of that? Well, I think voters should be concerned that their, their votes might not be counted, even if they followed all the rules. There's a very strong reliance interest, and I think the law takes that very seriously. Judges take that very seriously. So the hope is that if it comes down to it, if there is a state that really is going to tip the balance for one candidate or another, then that, that a judge would recognize that you can't say to voters who followed all the rules that states gave them that their vote is not going to be counted. And right now, that is a Republican argument that perhaps could go to the Supreme Court if, say, Pennsylvania were the, the key state. So, Jeannie, can, I'm sorry, Marjorie, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you think that's going to happen, that we're going to wind up with a Bush v. Gore situation, different, but in some ways right before the Supreme Court again? I think the chances of, of that go up if there really is one state that has this issue of, say, the, the votes that, were, that are being counted after Election Day, where Republicans think that anything that arrived after Election Day through the mail should not be counted, because that's an issue that the Supreme Court... Three justices have signaled that they're open to that and open to throwing out votes based on that argument. You know, Jeannie, the, the thing we've spoke, Marjorie and I on the radio and I here have spoken to a lot of legal scholars about the potential for a, uh, an outcome changer to end up before the Supreme Court, a la Bush v. Gore, which you and Marjorie were just discussing. And the answer is always given within fairly strict legal confines. Is there a case that merits the Supreme Court taking it that they could potentially rule for a Donald Trump, for example? And the reason I don't understand that criterion is, let me read to you, I'm sure you've memorized this, from Judge Kavanaugh in a recent 5-3 decision on Wisconsin and the counting of absentee ballots. Here's what he said. Those states want to avoid the chaos and suspicions of impropriety that can ensue if thousands of absentee ballots flow in another election day and potentially flip the results of an election. As I'm sure you know, the former dean of Harvard Law School, who's now in the Supreme Court, Elena Kagan, said, flip the results of an election. There are no results of an election until you've counted all the votes. He's essentially echoing almost word for word what the president of the United States said. If a justice is willing to, in my opinion, bend the law 
to accommodate his end game, his goal, why do we assume that in a six to three majority that they're not going to do whatever they got to do to reelect Donald Trump if the opportunity is presented to them? Well, I think the, the problem here is this very hard distinction that, that you or others are, are leaning on, which is, oh, there's the law, and then there's how you frame exactly. the legal issue. And in fact, what Justice Kavanaugh was doing in, in those words that you read was framing the legal issue in a certain way. He's kind of getting out ahead of it even before the votes yeah. have been counted. And that I, I do think that that was a very unwise thing to do, um, and it, would, it, it definitely shaped the, the way that current officials, Republicans, are, are talking about the matter. Well, the other thing that's also very frightening to people, um, particularly people that are, are on uh, Biden's, voted for Biden, is this notion that legislatures can overrule the will of the people and have their electors uh, go elect Trump, if, even if people there voted uh, for Biden. How, how, is that OK? And how does that work? That is a very, very fringy argument. Um, I, I don't expect that to carry the day, but, but some people will resort to that. Some, some people will try to resort to that if it turns out that that's the only way for their candidate to win. But, but we are right now focused on counting the votes. But just and one thing to, to note is that after the votes are counted, as contested as they are, there are still further hurdles after the vote counting. There's this selection of the electors, as you mentioned, there is the verification, the, the certification of the results. And then there's Congress's decision to uh, on what to do after counting the votes and how to count the votes. And so all of those are moments in which all kinds of arguments can be made and so chaos. So why do you call that fringy? If it turns out, my understanding is it's constitutionally permissible, feel free to disabuse me, for a Republican legislature to say, OK, the people voted for uh, Joe Biden in our state. But there was so much fraud in our judgment that we will pick electors who support the real winner, in quotes, of our vote, had there not been fraud, uh, Donald Trump. Why do you suggest that is fringy? I don't suggest that it's, it's fringy to throw out results based on fraud, actual fraud. But it is fringy to say, regardless, legislatures get to pick who our electors will be. It is true that fraud is a basis right. for negating certifications, for Congress to say we're not going to count the electoral votes the way they came in. So that is that that lies ahead, given that the president has been sounding that fraud alarm. I, I do think that he will probably pursue it all the way to the end. You know, before you go, Jeannie, you wrote a piece for The New Yorker that was talking about court packing or uh, court expansion that seems to be uh, a moot point right now. But you end the piece quoting FDR, who said he wanted an independent judiciary. And here's the quote. But it does not mean a judiciary so independent that can deny the existence of facts which are universally recognized. Uh, what is what did he mean and what did you mean? So I think that when we think about judicial independence, we mean independence from the political branches. That's centrally what we mean, that they're independent of partisan con concerns and of concerns by the executive branch and the Congress and the states. They have to be independent of all of those branches and those concerns. Um, but I think what FDR meant was we don't want them to be so independent that they're, they're, they basically have lost touch with reality, facts on the ground, and just the, the, the things that actually make this a country that is uh, guided by the rule of law. And maybe what the American people really want, despite the conservative majority. And that is majority. absolutely the most important idea. Jeannie Sue Gerson, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much for giving us your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.